Let me take you back for a moment to the 1960s, which really was the dawn of the business computer era. Governments and large corporations were increasingly investing large sums of money to install hefty computer systems to manage their day-to-day -day operations and record keeping. As expensive and cumbersome as these early business computers were, they revolutionised the processing and storage of information in a way that old paper files and cabinets could never compete with. The future was clear and computers were here to stay. The manufacturers of these new computers were doing well, but there was competition and each supplier was always looking for ways to outdo their rivals and increase their own market share. One of these companies was the respectable behemoth IBM Corporation. They watched their customers fill massive office buildings full of computer operators typing away all day every day, inputting everything from customer records to stock prices, weather data, news articles, book manuscripts and more. IBM realised the most critical link in the chain was the device that received this data directly from the human operator, the keyboard. They figured, understandably, that if they could come up with a design of keyboard that enabled all these thousands of computer operators to input, say, 10% more information per day, with a 50% reduction in typing errors when compared to rival company keyboards, that was going to be a major selling point, not just for IBM keyboards, but the whole large expensive computer systems. IBM was prepared to invest good money in making sure this would happen, and metaphorically locked a team of engineers, inventors and ergonomics experts in a workshop and told them they were not allowed out until they came up with something brilliant. It has to be said, when they did finally emerge with a prototype, they didn't disappoint. The mechanism they presented was called the Beam Spring Key Design, or the B-Type, and they submitted a patent for it in 1971. Whereas other manufacturers' keyboards had buttons that you'd be embarrassed to use for a doorbell, IBM now had a wonderfully comfortable clacky keyboard that was just a joy to type on. Unsurprisingly, most of IBM's computers in the 1970s used these new beam spring keyboards. People do swear by them to this day. But the beam spring design had its drawbacks. The mechanism was quite tall, making for very thick keyboards, and they were very susceptible to problems from fluff and dust. They were also difficult to maintain and keep in good running order, so the beam spring keyboards really just gave IBM something to work with during the 1970s, while well, they worked behind the scenes for six years on something even better. And then it came in late 1978. IBM were granted a patent for the whole new ultimate design of key mechanism, called, unremarkably, the buckling spring torsional actuator. IBM themselves described their new invention as thus a torsional or rocker switch actuator that uses the torsional moment of a buckling spring compression column to rock the actuator member on a pivot. A catastrophically buckling compression column spring is used and the reaction moment which occurs as the spring buckles is applied to rock an actuator back and forth between open and closed positions with cooperating contacts beneath the actuator. A non-teasable, snap-action, tactile feedback key mechanism of extreme mechanical simplicity and high reliability is achieved. This new key mechanism would be dubbed the F-Type, but it would be a few years later, in 1981, before IBM released a new computer featuring a keyboard that used it. This was the IBM System 23 Datamaster, a standalone all-in-one desktop computer for general business use. It was actually the cheapest IBM computer ever produced up to that date, but it still cost about US$9,000 in 1981, so it wasn't a particularly successful machine. Later that year came another computer from IBM that was to spark a revolution in computing. That's the original IBM PC on which all PCs since then are based. It wasn't especially powerful, fast or clever for its day, but it did use a lot of off-the-shelf components and could be made a lot cheaper than the System 23, while still providing very similar capabilities. Around $3,000 in 1981 it was popular, and of course it featured a keyboard based on the new F-Type mechanism. The keyboard was one of the most acclaimed components of the new magazine with one Byte magazine reviewer stating the IBM keyboard seems to be faultless. It is, by and on, the best keyboard on any microcomputer. It is extremely pleasant to use and promotes fast, accurate typing with its signature tactile auditory click. It also is ridiculously well made, with each key rated to a minimum of 100 million key presses before failure. To put that in perspective, if you were to type at the speed of a professional typist uniformly using all the keys 100 million times, and you type continuously at that speed for 8 hours a day every day without holidays, it would still take you 158 years before keyboard wear might just start becoming an issue. And that's just bonkers. The new keyboard featured top-of-the-line capacitance sensors rather than more basic plastic membrane, and with full NK rollover, it could detect every possible combination of simultaneous key presses at any one time.
But this quality came at a cost, $295 to be precise, and that's nearly a grand in today's money. But that wasn't just a scam, these keyboards did cost a lot to make. I own two of them, and despite being over 40 years old, they both still work like new, and I'm sure they will continue to do so for a very long time. But the high cost of production unfortunately meant IBM was soon forced to make compromises, especially with the influx of IBM PC compatible clones pouring onto the market with much cheaper and less refined keyboards. The IBM design team were once again locked in a room and told to rework the keyboard to make it cost just a third of the price to manufacture with as little compromise on quality as possible. While they were at it, they were told to address the only real complaint people had of the original keyboard. That's the key layout, which people were not overly enthusiastic about even with the slightly better version that came out with the IBM PC-80. So in 1985, IBM unveiled their latest revision, the perhaps deceptively named Enhanced Keyboard, based on their new cheaper Model M key mechanism. It did cost a third to produce of the earlier Model F based variants, and it was mass produced in great numbers. There was a lot less metal in it, the pads were much smaller, the plastic was more basic, and the full-length key rollover capacitance sensors were replaced with a cheaper and simpler membrane type affair. All this sounds like a huge compromise, but in reality it's still a really, really good keyboard. In fact, it's still way better than almost anything else made today. It's amazing they managed to cut such a lot of production cost out with only a very minimal effect on the end result. In fact, some people actually prefer the feel of an M-Type. It's still unquestionably a fantastic input device, and still has a huge fan base to this day. The new key layout was also an immediate hit, and most modern keyboards replicate this design because since these debuted in 1985, no one has managed to come up with anything better. Both the Model F and the Model M based keyboards also came in 122 key variants known today as the Battleship keyboard. I'm fortunate enough to also own two of these, but they use a lot of desk space. They are remarkably weighty and make a viable melee weapon during a zombie outbreak. All of these old IBM keyboards will work fine on a modern PC. The Model M type features a PS2 connector which is still relatively common on many computers, otherwise a very cheap PS2 to USB adapter will do the trick. The earlier Model F types are a bit more complicated, especially the original 83 key variants because the communication protocol they use is not natively supported anymore. However, there are active converters available, like this one, that will translate the old protocol to a new USB one, and they work just fine. Alternatively, several enthusiasts have gone into business remanufacturing these original keyboards to their original standards and offer them in custom colours and layouts with modern USB driving circuits, making a simpler way to enjoy the benefit of F and M type keyboards without having to hunt around for an original one. If you do want one from the 1980s with an IBM badge on it, you'll find the M type cheaper and easier to pick up, but even the F types are too hard to come by. Well, I hope this video has been useful to you. Please do like and subscribe and leave any comments that you wish in the section below. I do try to answer all of them. Thank you very much.